I think a lot of people in our industry like to pit active and passive investments together. And in reality, there's no passive decision in investing. Investing is never passive. You're making some form of active decision, whether it's how you weight index-based vehicles or what type of manager you hire. But all of these decisions are active decisions. The implementation of that should be based upon your fee budget, what's your risk tolerance, and ultimately a you know, viewpoint on paying higher fees for, say, a manager that has had a spotty track record. Are you ready for a successful retirement? We're addressing the topics facing today's retirees. Welcome to Retire with Ryan. Now here's your host, Ryan Morrissey. This week, we're going to continue on with our conversation with Matthew Bartolini, where we talk about ETFs. And here's my interview with Matthew. Thanks for coming back. We're continuing our conversation with Matthew Bartolini on ETFs. And last time we were talking about the taxation of ETFs, but I want to talk now about the primary focus of a lot of ETFs, which is passive investing strategies. Talk to me a little bit about passive and active investing, kind of some of the pros and cons of that? Sure. I mean, from a a passive perspective, it sort of correlates back to lower costs, so lower overall fees. You know, within our lineup, you can get exposure to broad U.S. equity markets for just three basis points. So really, really small, so 0.03%. You have the transparency of, of knowing exactly what you own and when you own it. You also have the nature of you know, rules-based investing, where there's a prescriptive set of rules that govern the indices. And again, that leads to more information on how, say, a portfolio is being managed, and that helps when performing due diligence. It's a little bit easier from that perspective. Historically, index-based vehicles have had stronger historical performance. You know, we look at the Spiva report relative back to benchmarks. Benchmarks can be hard to beat because of that low-fee nature of it. There's also less trading involved. Typical turnover or trading that takes place within, say, the S&P 500 is you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, say, 3 to 5%. So the portfolio itself is not being turned over a lot. There's not a lot of trading that takes place, and that can be helpful because anytime you trade, you're incurring some form of transaction cost. So from a passive perspective, it's that transparency, it's the low-cost nature of it, rules-based, and the strong historical performance because of Again, those lower fees. Now, active management performance in some markets have been troubling, you know, particularly on the U.S. equity side. The fees there are much higher, roughly about 100 basis points, about 1%. But active management is there to exploit inefficiencies in the market, mispricing. Also, some factor premium, which then also could be harnessed through an index-based vehicle, through smart beta factor investing. But other you know, value, the value premia or quality or momentum. So active management is taking that sort of either fundamental or quantitative view to pick stocks that have a higher probability of generating strong positive returns. And the access to that is the fee that the manager charges. As a result of that, there's a hurdle rate that an active manager needs to jump over in order to beat their benchmark. Because, you know, like I said, you can get broad U.S. equity market exposure for about three basis points. And if you're charging 100, well, you have to make up 97 basis points before you're sort of all square. And it has been a challenging in certain markets. U.S. equity managers over the last 10 years have not had really strong performance. Really, on average, only about 35% have outperformed their prospective benchmark in the U.S. equities. But and that's the last 10 years? That's over the last 10 years. Okay. So about 65%, you would have been better off if you just bought an index fund, essentially, right? Correct. Your core S&P 500 product, I know we've talked earlier about SPY, but... You came out with SPLG, right? At some because it's a lower cost, it doesn't have as much liquidity. But if you're holding it for a long time, it's not really necessary. Yeah, yeah. But you know, that's not to say that the active management doesn't work in different areas. You know, we wrote this report, portfolio construction for the next decade, thinking about you know where people should be thinking about from an asset allocation perspective and how to generate stronger returns. And active is going to play a part in it. I think based on the data that we've seen, there's a higher probability of finding an active manager who can outperform overseas. So covering international or emerging market equities or in some spots of fixed income, 
particularly in the intermediate core space. Okay. They both have a role in the portfolio. I think a lot of people in our industry like to pit active and passive investments together. And in reality, there's no passive decision in investing. Investing is never passive. You're making some form of active decision, whether it's how you weight index-based vehicles or what type of manager you hire. But all of these decisions are active decisions. The implementation of that should be decided upon based upon your fee budget, what's your risk tolerance, and ultimately, you know, you point on paying higher fees for, say, a, a manager that has had a spotty track record. Sure. Yeah. I mean, a lot of I've moved to mostly index based portfolios about like three years ago. I still use some active in certain spots, but I find a lot of clients don't even really understand what the fees are even involved, right, in their current portfolio. What do you think is the best place for an investor to look as far as what the fees are that they might be paying in their ETF or their mutual fund portfolio? Well, I mean, I I can only really speak for us. Our website clearly lists all the fees associated with the fund. You know, I think ETFs, just by nature of their history, they tend to be lower fee. I think ETFs, on average, the fees associated with them are around 40 basis points for the entire industry. Where you think of mutual funds, they're you know around 100. But I think you know going to the fund issuer's website is a good starting point because all of the information there for fund details, like the expense ratio, share price, total net assets, very basic information could be found there. But you know there's also really good third-party websites like you know Morningstar uh, provides a lot of in-depth information. And I think if it's for best insight I could provide would be that. You know, if it's hard to find out what fee you're being charged on an individual strategy, that might be a little bit of a warning sign. You know, if the asset manager is making it a little bit harder to understand it, if there's waivers and gross fees and net fees, you know, that might be a little bit of a red flag to say, okay, like what actually is this strategy doing to have this sort of complex arrangement of fees? Sure. Yeah, definitely. I think for a lot of people simplifying things, usually you are can understand it better and you have a more realistic idea of what the outcome might be. I sometimes see funds out there that'll show both a gross fee and a net fee. Yeah. How does that, what's happening there? So in some instances, you know, that is where an asset manager institutes a waiver where they want to reduce the expense ratio, but provide some flexibility in case they want to raise it later or get back. You know, sometimes it's based on market dynamics. You know, low interest rates for a money market fund, you just to waive your fee all the way down, you know, because this is basically, you know, you go to the board, your fund board, and you say, I'd like to institute a waiver for these specific reasons for the benefit of shareholders. We don't want to make it permanent because it's based on market dynamics. Because if you make it permanent, it's really hard to raise fees later if those market dynamics change, like interest rates from that perspective. So it's typically, you know, to lower the cost of the fund on a temporary basis reflect current market dynamics in the industry. Competition, I guess, right? If your competitor is charging 20 basis points, but you really want to charge 40, then maybe you waive the fee until it gets you know, to 20, until maybe enough assets get in the fund that you could charge 20. So we've never done that. We've seen that happen. We've seen that happen, which is not a really good client experience, sort of wave it down, get a lot of assets, and then let it go back up. It's really, in our instances, when we have used it, it's based on a competitive marketplace to give us more flexibility around the expense ratio and our pricing dynamics and how we, you know, in our economics as well. So there's really no one great reason, but it's going to be based on largely what's going on in the marketplace. Yeah. I mean, you know, some people might be surprised, like for, you know, like you said, 0.03%, you're getting access to all this. It almost seems like it's too low that it'd be hard to do everything that you probably have to do as a company to maintain you know, a fund? Well, yeah. I mean, there have been zero fee funds. There have been negative fee funds. You know, I would sort of question how no company is in this for zero, right? There has to be some form of revenue generation. So I always ask like, okay, if you're charging zero free, you know, where are you getting that revenue? And sometimes it could be on securities lending of the underlying securities and you maybe make a more aggressive mix, which then creates potentially unintended consequences. If there's a liquidity crunch, you need to recall those shares that are out on loan. For us, you know, we're a large firm, like I said in a previous conversation, you know, three trillion assets under management. That provides us some scale where we can share the economies with our clients and have those low fees. 
but other firms that maybe do it in a very low fee manner that don't have those assets, you know, I'd sort of wonder how they're making up for that lost revenue and if they have the infrastructure to support it. I think that's some of the benefit of our firm is we have a we were the innovators of the ETF industry in the US and we've had that infrastructure in place for twenty seven some odd years. Yeah, I've seen some funds, I've read about them where they'll pay you to invest in them. I think a few of them, right? I don't even understand how it's even possible. I guess it's a lost leader, maybe, right? Yeah, I mean, this is maybe too much inside the weeds in the weeds on this, but you know, we have some of our funds technically have income that exceeds the fee. And that's due to the ability for the underlying shares of the ETF. So like, for instance, XBI, so our biotech ETF, it owns a lot of mid and small cap biotech firms. Those are heavily sought after to be borrowed, those shares. So we can lend out shares of those biotech firms and make securities lending income. And because those shares are so highly sought after to be you know, shorted or borrowed, that creates lending income that is actually in excess of the expense ratio in certain years. So technically, you could argue that that one is essentially free as well, but there is an expense ratio part of it. But I think this is sort of the intricacies of the ETF industry that is really interesting from that perspective. Yeah. So as an investor, if you're looking at different, you're an excellent company, obviously, but there are other competitors in the space, right? If somebody's looking at, let's say, a large cap core holding that they're looking to buy, what would they want to look at comparing different options that they have what are some of the things that they'd want to look at to maybe make that decision? First and foremost would be that what is their benchmark of choice? They have a specific benchmark that they want to use, you know, say the S&P 500, and there's an ETF out there you know, that's 0.03% fee, but there's another one that's 0.02%, but it's benchmarked to say a very generic, like a 500, you know, I'm not going to name a benchmark name, someone that's, that's not well known something that's sort of a ripoff of the heritage S&P 500. You know, that would be like, is that the right benchmark for me? It's sort of similar, but it's not. What choices do you need to make? So it would come down to like fee, benchmark of choice, the liquidity of the ETF. You know, again, if the cheapest ETF from an expense ratio perspective may not be the lowest cost after you take into account transaction costs, trading fees. So understanding that is really important. So fees, benchmark, and trading costs would be three things that that I would really look at. Yeah. So when you say trading costs, a lot of the, I use TD Ameritrade Institutional as my primary custodian. They've waived their trading costs. A lot of other large custodians have as well. But part of that cost too is also would be the bid ask spread, right? On the fund. So meaning that what you, if you're looking to buy the fund, what you would pay versus if you are selling the fund, what you would pay. And there's a spread there. Tell me a little bit about that. Right. So, you know, anytime you trade a stock, there's a bid in the ask where the broker is going to buy or sell at for them to make their money in terms of transacting security. ETFs are just the same. There's a bid in the ask. And sometimes on ETFs, they can be four or five cents wide. Perhaps if they don't have the same liquidity as some of the liquidity leaders that you know we have in our suite, like an SPY, which trades you know, pretty much at a penny wide spread for the last every day for almost the last 15 years. So understanding that type of bid ask spread in terms of how it manifests itself in transaction costs is really important. Because if you're trading a lot, and if you're rebalancing a lot, you would want to sort of focus perhaps on the more efficient ETF in terms of trading costs rather than the lowest expense ratio. Because ultimately, you're going to be paying more in transaction costs if you're constantly churning your portfolio if you choose the higher bid-ask spread ETF. Yeah, with that higher spread. Yeah, I mean, I've seen some ETFs that have very wide spread do a lot of the State Street funds, this, do you find the spread is pretty consistent on them? Or is it certain like areas that maybe the spread is wider? So you know, part of this is having, again, we go back to infrastructure in place, capital markets team that works with market makers to ensure our bid-ask spreads are within a range of possibilities or within reason of where the underlying securities are trading. Because sometimes it's just a function of where the underlying securities are. This bid-ask spread will widen out. A lot of our ETFs have been around for a long time. They're heavily utilized by a multitude of users, whether it's tactical, long only, short investors, investors that express in views through options. You know, I think we have roughly about 65% of the options market is tied to our ETFs. Sorry, options on ETFs. And all of that just creates more liquidity into the underlying product for even just the, the more 
retail investor who may not be trading that much. So a lot of our ETFs have really consistent bid-ask spreads, really high liquidity. I mean, we have five out of the 10 most liquid U.S. equity ETFs out in the marketplace right now covering SPY, also our sectors. So you know, we have this persona, and rightfully so, we have the most trading volume out of any other ETF issuer out there as being this liquidity leader. And we sort of showcase it, not just in how much our products trade, but also by the insights that we can deliver to clients about how they can trade, when they should trade, and what their execution strategy should be in terms of trade type, you know, there's limit order, stop loss, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier about indexes, different indexes. That was a great point. There's a lot of ways you can measure the market. You mentioned the S&P 500 is a common one, but then you've got the Russell indexes, right? And so you've got the S&P indexes, the Russell, the Crispin index, right? And then is there another one? I mean, there's been a handful of indices that have now come out from newer entrants to the marketplace. So it really requires a lot of due diligence in terms of where there might be gaps or overlaps when you're starting to blend all those indices together. And, you know, I think what we're seeing now is there's different rules associated with, say, the Russell indices. You know, they rebalance once a year. S&P rebalance quarterly, and, you know, that can create different exposures based on market movements. One stock really rallies quite significantly. You can have a significantly different weight, and it's basically covering the same marketplace. So while expense ratio is important of the due diligence process, so is liquidity, also is the whole of the underlying index and the rules that are associated with it. Because ultimately, what's going to drive performance is the holdings. And if you have two seemingly similar indices, but with very different rules, you could have a different performance result. So understanding those differences is really important. The biggest one that always gets talked about is the S&P 600 versus the Russell 2000. They both cover small cap equities, but the S&P 600 has a significant performance advantage relative to the Russell 2000. That largely is a result of the rebalancing of the Russell 2000, it's sort of annual reconstitution, but also the fact that the S&P 600, you have to have four consecutive quarters of profitability in order to be included. So it removes some of these really volatile, unprofitable small cap stocks. So there's a quality aspect to the S&P 600 that leads to stronger historical performance. Yet, when you sort of stack them up in a category, they both say small cap, but they're really different from that perspective. Yeah. And I mean, is the name what it is? There's 600 in the S&P 600 and 2000. Okay. So that's also probably part of the difference too, right? I mean, you've got 1,400 less names that could be for good or bad. Yeah. Hope that you enjoyed this episode, learning more about ETFs. And if you're enjoying these podcasts, I'd always appreciate a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. And just a reminder that I'm beginning my retirement readiness workshops at the end of February. So if you're interested in signing up for those, please go to retirewithryan.com. And under workshops, you can sign up for those classes. I hope that you have a great week and I look forward to talking to you next Wednesday. Take care. You should consult a financial advisor familiar with your specific circumstances before you make any financial decisions. Nothing in this broadcast constitutes a solicitation for the sale or purchase of any securities. Any mention of rates of return are historical or hypothetical in nature and are not a guarantee of future returns. Ryan Morrissey, CFP, is an investment advisor representative of Morrissey Wealth Management, LLC, a registered investment advisor. 